CSS is an abbreviation for Cascading Style Sheets, and it is a special file allowing you to control the look and the layout of a web page. CSS was introduced to HTML back in 1996 by <laughs> two guys whose names I cannot pronounce, but I'll, <laughs> I'll give it a shot. I think uh, Hakone William Lee and Yilbert Burt Boss which is probably completely wrong. But anyway, although it took a good few years for it to catch on, there are two major advantages to using CSS to control the aesthetics of your website. Number one, it allows you to globally control elements on your entire site. And number two, it gives you the opportunity to use responsive design. So, first, <laughs> what do I mean when I say globally control elements on your website. Well, let's say for example, you've built a website with 30 or 40 pages, okay? And when it was first built, you decided to use a certain font for the entire website. And later you wanna change that font. Well, if you used an inline style or a font tag, you would have to manually change that font on every single page of your website. Not only would that be time consuming, but you could easily make a mistake and miss an update somewhere. Using an external CSS file, you can change the reference to the font style in the CSS and it will change everywhere, all of your website, over all 40 pages, all at once. So that's pretty cool, right? And how does this cool technology benefit the users? Simple, by reducing the likelihood of making a mistake. Easing your workload makes for a more professional and consistent guest experience. Secondly, implementing CSS allows you to use responsive design in your code. So what is responsive design? Well, back in the early days of the internet, websites were often built with an ideal screen resolution in mind. Back then, people only viewed websites on CRT monitors with a four to three ratio resolution of 800 by 600 or 1024 by 768 or 1280 by 1024 and so forth. Now these days, people visit websites on countless devices, HD monitors, laptops, tablets, smartphones, all of these devices have numerous potential resolutions and aspect ratios. So how can you design a single website that will look good on all of those devices? By using responsive design. Responsive design is a programming concept, a kind of design philosophy, if you will, that uses CSS to dynamically reformat your page based upon the resolution of the device it is being viewed upon. In essence, you're actually using CSS to build multiple versions of the website. Now, you can become as granular with responsive design as you want. You could build a website for only two resolutions, desktops at 1920 by 1080 and smartphones. Or you could build for desktops, laptops, and smartphones, or you could make five different iterations at granular resolutions between different tablet manufacturers. Whatever you want, whether you make two versions or 12 versions of your website catering to various resolutions, all of those iterations are still considered responsive design. And there are three ways that you can add CSS to your website. One is inline styles, two is embedding things on the page, and three is an externally linked file. So, for this video, I will show you the three ways to implement styles, then I'll show you some basic functions of CSS, then I'll show you some responsive design examples, then we'll do a few neat things with fonts, and I will then show you my old Disney training page. So, let's start with the three implementation approaches. Let's kind of quickly go over the three primary ways to 
use CSS, inline, embedded, and linked. So first is an inline style, and you can see this sentence uses Courier font with an inline. And then if we come to embedded, it uses it with embedded. And finally, we can do it with linked. And this one also changes the color to blue, okay? But other than changing the color on this one, you can see that they're all the same thing. So let's look at the source code for each of these so we can understand exactly what it is that they're doing. So if we look at the first one, which is inline, we can see right here within a span tag, we've simply called a style of a font family. In a linked version, sorry, let's go back. <laughs> <laughs> let's go back to let's go back to lesson B before we get to lesson C. So in the embedded style, we're actually defining a class called this changes the font and this is a variable. So we can name this anything we feel like. And we could just call it um, poopy doo and it's still gonna work. So <laughs> then we call, that class down here in the span. So we change that to poopy do, and it's still gonna be the same thing. So this is lesson B embedded. If we come up here and refresh the page, it still works. If we view the source code, we can see it's been changed to poopy do, and everything is still working just fine. So this format right here of naming your variable for that class and then defining it between these two brackets that is also used for the linked version so if we come here to lesson c on the linked version we can see that within the head tag we have a new html element that we haven't used before which is called link and then rel is telling you what it is that we're linking to, which is a style sheet. And then we're using an href, which is calling a file path to the CSS. So let's take a look at that. If we come into includes and we look at style sheet, there we go. So you can see right here, this changes the font is again, it's a lot like this style right here in the embedded version, but now it's in its own file, it's in a CSS file. And now we're calling the font family, but we're also attributing a color to it as well. So if we come back here into linked, we can see that again, we're just calling the class and this class is defined right here. So it's very similar to embedded where we're calling the class and it's embedded on the page. All right, so that is why everything functions the way it does here in the linked version. It's calling the courier class and it's assigning the color of blue. The next thing I will show you are media queries. A media query is a special type of CSS that can change the CSS parameters based upon the size of the screen, which is responsive design. Usually it's used to change the positioning or the size of an element. You may even use it to make things vanish completely. For example, if you have a website with a lot of graphics and information on the screen for a desktop site, you might want it to become more simplified when it's viewed on a smartphone. Therefore, you would use a media query to make some of those extraneous elements invisible at smaller screen resolutions. Now let's talk about media queries. Media queries are, well, the way that I do them is a little different than the way that most people do them. But you can see here, I'm also gonna use a different browser. I'm gonna use Firefox for this. So basically I have a couple examples. This photo will resize as the browser resizes. This photo is gonna change into a different photo when the browser gets to a different size. And then this final picture will completely disappear. So. Let's show you how that works. So let's shrink the window down. And from right here, from this point, we can see everything still stays the same. But as I 
resize the window, you can see that the eagle picture is, is resizing. It's getting smaller. And when we get down to this point, now you can see this picture actually changed. So if I come back, make it a little bit bigger, it's the photo of the girls holding the flag. And then if I shrink it down to that point, now it's the flag hanging off the tree. And right here, you can see that bottom photo disappeared. So if I open it back up again, we can see that photo is still there. If I close it down a little smaller, we can see that bottom photo disappears completely. Okay, so how did I do all of that? Well, let's take a look at source code. So the first thing that you should notice is this new meta tag. This is used to tell the browser how to resize things for smartphones, which is basically the concept that I'm trying to get across right here. So if this web page was viewed on a smartphone, it would look a little bit different than it would if you're looking at it full resolution in a browser, okay, or on a desktop, that is. So on a smartphone, you'd be getting different pictures or different pictures could disappear and change and can resize themselves and so forth. So first, we're calling one style sheet calling called styled. And then this next style sheet contains media queries. And I call it 360 by 640. That's just to let me know at what screen size and at what resolution does this style sheet start to take effect? When I say that I do media queries a little differently than most people, like this is what I'm talking about, okay? Most people don't put their media query in a separate file with the resolution spelled out like that, but I like to do it that way just because it makes it a little bit less confusing a little bit easier to track. And if for whatever reason, if you end up changing your resolutions in your media query someday, you can easily just get rid of those files and know that it's not going to affect anything else. So let's take a look first. Before we get into the media query, let's look at the regular styled CSS. So if we come into here, we can see our first div class has a number of features. It gives the width in pixels, the background color, and the margins. And that is what defines this first div at the top of the page. So you can see it's 400 pixels wide. There's a gray background and there's margins around it. So next, instead of using a class, we're using an ID. So all the classes start with a period you can see right here, that's a class, this is a class, but the ID starts with a hashtag. And the difference is that IDs are supposed to just be called once on the page, whereas classes could be called multiple times. So in there, we've called the ID super fonts. So right here, you can see within this div, we're calling the class of that first div, and then we're calling on this span, we're calling the ID of super fonts, and that is Arial Black. So that's why we can see this is the Arial Black font in the browser. So the next section is all of our images and what's being defined there. So you can see that I've put all of the images into uh, div tags. So this first one is the class of picture something, and it's giving a max width of 100%. Now, that variable, or I shouldn't say this, this is the variable, but I should say that um, this element within the variable of max width 100%, that is what allows the eagle photo to resize. So it's saying that the maximum width of the image is 100% of its actual size, but it could be smaller than that. So that's why it can shrink down and get really tiny. Again, the background color is defined. So we have the div with a gray background and we have margins around it. And then if we come back in here, here is the path to that file and we call it altering photo. And again, we have max width 100% on the image as well as the div that's surrounding it. 
Then we have changing image and vanishing image. Now you can see right here, changing image and vanishing image, they just define the height and width of the div. The image comes in as a background image and then there's a path to it. And then we're also telling it not to repeat the image in the, uh, I believe the first one is horizontal plane and the second one is vertical. I could be wrong, I'd have to look it up. It's not that important, I don't really care. <laughs> <laughs> that's the kind of stuff that I say, you know, I don't memorize it. I just go look it up. So that's pretty simple. You know, it's just calling these images into these divs, right? It gets a little bit more complicated when we start to actually apply the media query. So let's take a look at what the media query is doing. So right here is our media query CSS. And as you can see, all you're doing is redefining an existing CSS class, okay? So we have changing image and vanishing image defined in styled CSS. But in the media query version, we have changing image and vanishing image repeated. But you'll notice that there are these two brackets here. So changing image and vanishing image are embedded within these two brackets and this right here is the text that is called a media query. So in other words, what it's telling the browser is that at a max width of 390, okay, this stuff is no longer being used. So it's only if the resolution of the browser, if the width of the browser is 390 pixels or less, it uses this. If it's 391 pixels or more, it's going to be using this. Okay? And you'll also notice that the things that were changed are also the sizes. So, for example, on changing image, width and height is 550 and 400, and on this it's 300 and 400. Okay, and you can see it's calling the sunrise image, and here it's calling the fold image. And then under vanishing image, I didn't change anything. I just put in display none, as opposed to this that has all of these parameters. Okay, so once the browser gets beneath 390 pixels, it's going to be using these features of those classes. So again, this is pulling the styled CSS. And once we shrink it down to this point, it's now pulling the styled 360 by 640 CSS. The next thing we'll talk about is web fonts. And these are actually really cool because in the past, if you wanted to have fonts that were anti-aliased on a web page, you basically had to make a graphic, but now you can do it with actual text. So right here you can see a number of different examples. This is Source Sans Pro, this font is Crimson, this is Quattrocento, and this last one is Growbold, which is the font that I'm using for most of the stuff on this website. So how does all this work? Well, if we look at the source code, we can see it's pretty simple. I'm just calling a bunch of spans and a bunch of classes, first font, second font, third font. Okay, so each one of these has got its own class name. And here's a style sheet that I'm calling called font stuff. So let's go look at that. So font stuff. Now, most people, when they use web fonts, they will call an external source, like let's say, for example, from Google, they might call these fonts. Um, I don't like to do that. I don't think it's a good idea to be calling things into your website from other sources. You should have everything on your own site. So that's what I've done. I have Crimson and Source Sans Pro and all these different fonts right in here. So we can see that they're coming from um, 
includes and from fonts and here are the font files okay which correspond to all the font files that are being called here and then you'll also notice that the font families are defined for each of these and then down here we can see the CSS that is calling that font family so first font is calling Source Sans Pro second font is calling Crimson okay and so on and so forth and then again if we come back in here we can see first font second font so you can see how all that matches up okay so grow bold is the fourth font class if we come in here we can see fourth font is calling grow bold and then right here we can see where those font files are actually located okay so that really is about it it's pretty simple but as I said, the most important thing is making sure that you're using fonts that you have copies of on your own web server. Okay, don't follow, don't follow the flock, <laughs> don't do what everybody else is doing, and pull the fonts from other sources. Because what if those fonts change, or what if they get moved? You know, then it'll end up breaking your whole website and none of the fonts are going to show up. So it's a lot better to keep them on your own server. Finally, I thought it would be kind of fun to share with you the original page that I created uh, for Disney when I was teaching classes on CSS. Now, I'm actually not going to go over this whole thing simply because everything that's in here is kind of redundant. It's sort of everything that I've already taught you in the previous lessons but if you just wanted to kind of see a different approach to the same concepts of CSS you know this is kind of an interesting page to go over because it does teach all the exact things that I was teaching while at Walt Disney Studios. Now you have a solid foundation for the basics of CSS. I didn't cover a great deal of layout using CSS, but you get the idea. Div elements can be repositioned and resized with CSS classes. Now, as I mentioned in earlier videos, you know, <laughs> computer nerds, they'll tell you don't ever learn tables and just do layouts using div tags and CSS. Well, I disagree. You see, there are good and bad to each. CSS is good because it allows for responsive design. Tables are bad because they're not as well suited to responsive resizing. But CSS can be bad too when used improperly. Using CSS for positioning can be awful because it becomes horribly confusing and convoluted code because all the parameters for sizing and positioning things on the page are located in a separate CSS file or elsewhere on the HTML page. And every div parameter is dependent upon the div it is nested within. This means if you want to change anything, you're constantly swapping back and forth, cross-referencing between the CSS and the HTML files, trying to figure out what goes where and what is nested inside of what. That is an awful way to build a web page and a nightmare to maintain and make any modifications. Now, to make matters worse, CSS can use a parameter which provides fixed positioning on the page meaning you tell the HTML the exact pixel coordinates you want the element to appear on the page, regardless of where things are written in the source code. This means instead of things happening in a logical order, a poorly programmed page can actually have elements scattered all over the source code. The top navigation might be at the bottom of the code. The photos in the side of your page might be the first thing in the code. You never know. Things can get strewn everywhere. Again, that's an atrocious way to learn programming because it has too much potential to be total chaos. So why are tables a good idea for a beginner? Well, tables are smart for beginners to learn because tables control all the layout and positioning within the HTML page itself in order right down from the document top to the bottom. Yeah, tables can also get complicated and confusing. They can be clunky and they don't necessarily have the brevity of CSS and div tags. However, 
since tables exist in a single file and they aren't cross-referencing any of their parameters, tables are much easier to read and learn and understand because everything is right in front of you instead of being tucked away in separate files. Sloppily constructed tables are bad. Sloppily constructed CSS is really bad. <laughs> Putting content in div tags and positioning them with CSS is far superior to tables when the CSS is used properly. So now you have a basic understanding of CSS and what you can do with it. There are dozens of parameters that can be assigned to dozens of tags, so it's very powerful. You can even use CSS to do crazy animations or special effects. Explore the possibilities of CSS more on your own. Discover what it can do. Figure out as much as possible so you can build wonderful things. Because remember, kids, the world owes you nothing until you create things of value.